Good morning. As it takes just a minute. Kind of like me in the morning, takes just a minute. Nice to have you here on this very warm Sunday morning. I was going to change, and then these clothes didn't want to peel off, so you get a t-shirt that says salvation, but that works out because we're going to have an old-time revival today, although the tent would have been nice. I thought about bringing it, but I was afraid the wind might blow it away. If you look on the back of your bulletin, we have a bunch of announcements um, and people that we have kept in prayer, some new ones we've added to the list. Um, but the exciting news is we actually get to go back inside where it is air conditioned. I'm going to be really happy for that. Now I know why the funeral fans were so popular at revivals. But we're going to get to go inside next week on the 5th. Now don't forget that this is the time change. So it's going to be at the FCC at um, 930 and it will be at the PUCC at 11 o'clock. So make sure you let everybody know that that is coming up. Um, so be prepared. When you go into church, things are going to look a little different. But you know what? We're kind of used to different right now. Uh, the pews have been, we've had to take out all the hymnals and the Bibles and anything that's, that you can touch, basically. Um, so it's going to look a little bare. And we're going to have you guys kind of sit where you normally do if you're in family units of you know however many you guys can sit together but then we got to leave six to eight feet apart all directions around and we will ask that when you do sit we'll get it all figured out that first Sunday that you would continue to sit in those places just because it makes it easier for everybody to know where to go and we can clean and disinfect the sanctuary afterwards so we want to thank everybody who's um, already volunteered to do that. Those who've removed the the books and the hymnals and the bullet and the Bibles from all the pews of both churches, and those that have been cleaning and preparing for you. Now, those who can't come or don't feel like they want to come to church, that is fine. We are going to actually be doing just like now, live Facebook at the church, as well as it will be on YouTube. It will still be on Cobalt and. We're going to see if we can make the radio work because we can hit at least, I think, most all of Aurora with the radio. So you can tune in to 100.5 and listen in. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. If you would join with me in the call to worship, rejoice in the Lord always. We praise God in the good times and in the bad. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We praise God in the storms, rain, sunsets, and the morning dew. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, we say rejoice. If you pull out your first hymn, if you notice, we're going to do a lot of singing, not too many verses of each one, but this is a good old revival and... You know, that's what they did at the good old revivals. They did a lot of singing, a lot of scripture, and a lot of preaching. Even hell, uh, fire and hellstone. And I said, you know what? I think we're already there. We got the brimstone and the fire going. It's heating up pretty good. So if you'll join me in, I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. is from Deuteronomy. We don't dig into that book very often, but there's some really good words here on chapter 7, verse 9. 
Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. If you would join with me in our next hymn, we're going to sing, Give Me That Old Time Religion. So we're going to sing it straight through with all the verses, and then we're going to go back and we're going to finish with the first verse again. Scripture comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, 35 and 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. If you would join with me in the prayer in your bulletin. Lord, we come today in need of a revival. We come searching and asking for your truth. We come in desperation looking for answers. We come with a desire and a hunger for you, your word, and your saving salvation. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> fill us with the hope and peace. And fill us with living water that can only come through you. Amen. And that holy living water, we're going to sing our next hymn, but I got a little story I got to tell you first. See, there was this old time revival pastor, and he was up there and he was a preaching and he was talking about all the sins of the world and he was talking about the addictions and he said, and I want you to go in and I want you to take all those cigarettes and I want you to take them down to the river and I want you to throw them in the river. And he said, and then I want you to go and I want you to get all the booze and I want you to take it down and I want you to toss it into that river. And after he said that, and the people said, amen. He said, all right, let's sing our next song. And it was, shall we gather at the river? offering. I know some of you have already uh, brought those up, so um, you know what? We have a bucket, and so afterwards, we're just going to observe offering for right now, and then before you leave, we'll have a bucket out there that you can just drop it in. But let us take this time to thank God for everything he's given us. Thank him for lemonade that's made out of lemons. Thank him for the heat and the humidity because it produced the rain last night. 
Thank him for all of the things that we have so graciously been given and those things that we can share with others to continue to be his hands and feet throughout this world. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for that which we've offered up back to you. It is our first fruits. We give to you first because you gave to us before that. We thank you and we ask that you would bless them and that we would multiply them for your use. In Christ Jesus, your Son. Amen. Our next scripture is from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You would join with me in our next hymn. We're going to sing, I'll Fly Away, verses 1 and 3. and 39 for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height or depth or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord what exciting and hopeful words that even in the perilous times, no matter what forces that we fight, no matter what assails us, nothing can possibly separate us from the love of our loving God. If you would join with me, and when we all get to heaven, we're going to sing the first and the fourth verse.
Well, as I pondered today's scripture, I should say all the scriptures, and the message, I asked God, what do you possibly want me to tell them at this time? What is, what is the burning desire? And that's when I came up with the idea as our last Sunday here, a good old revival Sunday. How many here by honk have ever attended a good old revival? All right, I got a couple. As I was gonna say, you either have to live in the South or you gotta be a lot older than me. But although we used to have revivals, they were just not in a tent, they were in a church. And in the church that I grew up in, we would bring in speakers and we would bring in pastors and we would have a good old revival for a whole week. And it was in York and I went to McCool, but we were kind of sister churches. And we would get together and we would have mass choirs and, and special music. And it was an exciting, exciting time. In fact, I remember one, one year in particular, we had a gentleman from Australia, a doctor and, and a pastor who came and he spoke. And he had been staying at our place because that was custom that they would take turns staying at, at the family's residence. And he was fascinated by this little creature that kept running around in the streets. And he couldn't call him a squirrel, he called him a squirrel. And those of you who don't know, I actually do wood carving. My grandfather had taught me how to do that. And so I think I was only in sixth grade or seventh grade, but I made him, I carved him out a squirrel pin so that would pin so he could wear it and he could take it home to tell people in Australia about these curious little creatures that we have. And in return, before he left, he gave me this little golden kangaroo pin that I still have to this day. But those were wonderful times, and as kids, I remember it was packed. All of the youth would come, and we would sit, and we would sing, and we would listen, and we would listen to the stories. See, that's what this world has lost, is the stories that are in the Bible. That's why I keep pushing over and over again that you need to read your Bible. You need to do Bible studies so that way you can learn the stories, because as we know, history repeats itself over and over and over again. So what could I say for today? Well, I was looking at all the, the sermons on salvation, and guess what? It led me, strangely, to 1 Kings chapter 18. Now, for those of you who might not know, Kings is the book that talks about all the different kings throughout Israel, started with David and Solomon, and, or Saul, David, Solomon, and on down the way. And now we have a king of Israel called Ahab. Ahab was an interesting man because he was the king over Israel, but he did something that he wasn't supposed to do. God said, serve me and only me. And when he talked about not intermarrying with tribes, it had nothing to do with race or color. It had everything to do with religion because he didn't want his chosen people to be influenced by outside sources. And what did Ahab do? He did exactly what God told him not to do. Because of, of power and, and wealth and wanting to combine countries, he took for himself a Phoenician bride by the name of Jezebel. Now you may have heard that name. She was an interesting woman because she was very strong in her spirituality. And with her, she didn't come quietly to just join forces. No, she came with an entourage, a parade with drums and cymbals, and she brought with her 450 priests of Baal and 400 priests and priestess of Astra. Now think about that. God said don't, and now we're doing a parade with 850 priests and priestess of foreign gods. And they walked right on in. Well, as you can about imagine, things did not go well. And immediately Israel started turning away from God. And they started following this interesting God by the name of Baal. Now I want to give you a little history because there's actually a reason for this. 
We hear the term Baal all the time in the scriptures, but did you know who Baal really is? See, all the different cultures, all the different countries and religions, they all started with the same God, except for Israel, and that was Satan. And when they got separated at the Tower of Babel, there became different names. For, for Egypt, it became Osiris. For the Greeks, it became Zeus. For Rome, it became Jupiter. And the names go on and on, Kronos, and, and there's a whole laundry list of names, but they all represent Beelzebub, which is Satan. So when Baal come waltz, waltzing in, Israel literally let Satan march right on into town. Now there was a man, a prophet by the name of Elijah. I'm sure most of you have heard of that man, Elijah. And he was given a message by God that he was supposed to go and talk to Ahab and tell him that God was not happy. Now you have to realize by this time, the priests and the priestess had already set up camps. They already had their altars made up and they had been worshiping their gods for quite a while. So Elijah comes in and he does a throwdown. <laughs> We've heard that term before, haven't we? A throwdown, a showdown. But Elijah didn't do it against the priests. He pitted God against God. He pitted the God Yahweh against the God of Baal. Now why I bring this up, because unless you know the history, this story isn't gonna make a whole lot of sense. Because Elijah does something peculiar. He has them take their altar and go ahead and he tells them we're gonna, he says, we're, we're gonna do a throw down here and it's gonna involve a sacrifice, but you have to do it by my rules. He said, I want you to make an altar, or he made the altar, but I want you to put the fire on it, I want you to kill the, the bowl, and I want you to prepare it. And then we're gonna stand back and we're gonna have your God light that bowl on fire. Well, people were all for that because you have to realize, see, Baal at that time, which I said was Zeus, which in Norway is actually Thor, is the god of storms. He is the god of the lightning bolt. He is the god of fire. So when Elijah is doing this, he's saying, I, I'm not picking a, a god of water to produce fire. He's saying, you worship a god of fire. Let's see it. So that's what they did, and they were all for it. And it said that there had been a drought for three years because God had stopped the rain. Now think about this, because Baal was what? The God of storms. Their own God could not produce the rain to stop the famine. So that's when Elijah comes. So they, they go through all their acts and gyrations and just made fools of themselves trying to get their God to light this wood on fire, and it didn't happen. And Elijah starts taunting them, and then he says, okay, after enough is enough, he tells them, he says, now what I want you to do is he built an altar out of 12 stones for the 12 tribes of Israel. He made his own altar, he put his own bowl on it as it was prepared, and then he had him dig a moat around the whole altar. And then he had him fill it with water. And then he said, stand back. <laughs> and what did God do? Boom! He not only ignited that altar and that wood, it said everything was completely consumed in a flash, just like that. See, we serve a God who is real. We serve a God who is powerful. We serve a God that surmounts all of the little gods that this world could ever follow and the entities that claim to be those gods. And afterwards, then, Elijah gives Ahab warning, and he says, I'm going to give you a head start, but you better get back to the valley of Jezreel because the rains are coming. And that's exactly what happened. God brought the rain. Once the idols were out, the entity were out, and they realized who the real God was, God ended the drought. See, he trumped the storm God. He produced the fire. So why do I bring this up with the stories? Think about Egypt. 
every one of those, the, the curses that were brought, the plagues that were brought, they were not happenstance. Every plague represented a God, a deity that the Egyptians worshiped. And God showed them time and time, 10 times, who was still the real God. In fact, even when they got to the, the waters of the Red Sea, there was a reason for the parting of the waters because they worshiped Osiris, who was the king of the sea. And what did that king do? He swallowed up the Egyptians because our God is greater. See, it was Joshua who was standing before those entities as they were getting ready to go into the promised land that said he drew a line in the sand and he said, for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I know we put that on top of our doors. We put them fancy little poems and cute little bookmarks that we carry around, but we don't realize and internalize the depth of that saying. It was a line in the sand. Are you with me or are you against me? Are you going to follow God and go into the promised land or are you going to fall for the foreign gods? We see throughout time and time again in the scriptures that God is constantly causing a time when people have to draw a line in the sand and say, for me and my household, we are going to serve God. Of course, you can't have a revival without bringing it to today, can you? We're at that point, people. We are right now at that point, even in this country. We are under complete attack, and it's from spiritual forces. That's exactly who we're fighting against. Only the nice thing is, Ephesians reminds us, it's not our fight. It's Jesus' fight. Sometimes he calls us to take a stand. You know, when I was in, um, I can't believe it was a year ago. It was a year ago I went to Israel. It was a year ago we just got back. I said yesterday, I said, wow, this is when we came home from Italy. But with both of those times, we went to New York to begin with. I'd never been to New York, and so I got to go twice. But did you know? Did you know? See, we even talk about Baal and Satan, and, and in Revelation at, at the... Um, to the church of Pergamon, he said the throne of Satan. And who is the throne of Satan? It's actually the temple of Zeus that is sitting right there at Pergamon. Guess what, folks? That temple of Baal, that arch of Baal, appeared in New York City just a few years ago, and I got to see it, not once but twice. And again, that arch of Baal appeared in Washington, D.C., right here on our own land. And how many people even know that, let alone are taking a stand going, this is wrong. We are a nation under God. Next week, we're going to be celebrating what? Independence Day. And it was freedom for religion. They did have freedom before they came to this world. They went to Holland, but unfortunately the Dutch enslaved them and they were starving to death. So that's why they came to America, to seek out a new world, to have a better life and freedom of religion. My question is, is the Holy Spirit burning in your heart today? If you knew half of the things that were going on that we don't see, it would scare you. But that's why all the scriptures of hope that's why knowing your Bible, that's why learning your stories, because you could see men and women throughout the entire pages that were faced with far worse. And yet, like Queen Esther, had to take a stand. And she did the hard thing, not knowing the outcome, but was rewarded because she serves a mighty God, the same God that each of us who came here today serve and call Lord. I gave you a challenge when we met two weeks ago. I said in this world where we're getting flooded with so much information and it changes hour by hour. And it's really easy to become consumed and to spend all of our time watching and listening to news and social media. I gave a challenge that for every hour or every minute that you spend listening to the outside world that you spend reading the scriptures. 
I want to know how many people took up that challenge and did it. Because I can guarantee you, if you did, you started noticing things. Where there was fear, all of a sudden there was no fear. Where there was despair, all of a sudden you started finding hope. Where there was frustration and, and uncertainty and insecurity, you found a God who says, I am in control. I spent Friday up in Fremont. I had a gentleman from a past congregation. I don't have a, really a pastor right now serving, and he's been gone for quite a while. And they called and said, things aren't going good. Would you come up and see him? And I said, you bet. So I made the trek up to Fremont, and we talked. And he wanted me to read the scriptures. And out of all the scriptures, I read stuff from Psalms. But you know what the Holy Spirit pressed on me? said, read from John. Start at the beginning of the Gospel of John. And I guarantee you, if you've never picked up your Bible, if you know somebody who's never picked up a Bible, don't have them start at Genesis and go through Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers. No. Start with the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word. And I love it because we have a saying that's on the, the streets, maybe not here, but in more of the metropolitans. What's the Word? Word? The word is Jesus. It's so bad when I say that. But nobody's asked me here. So you got to tell people in, in Aurora, they say, what's the Word? It's Jesus. That is our hope. That is our salvation. That is is who is going to get us through any tribulation. Jesus says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. In this world, you're gonna have trouble. And what we have is nothing compared to what those disciples went through. And guess what? They also had to draw a line in the sand. But he said, I have overcome the world. I am the resurrection, the way, and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even though he shall die, shall live. Folks, I know a lot of you have sat in pews your whole life. And maybe, just maybe, I found out that a lot of people sitting in those pews, they came to listen about a God, but they never got a relationship with the God we serve. See, we don't serve the God of Baal or the God of Ashtar or the God of Moloch or, or Zeus or Thor or any of those. We serve a living God, one that wants a relationship with each and every one of you. One that only asks for your heart. One who did the very thing for you that he would never ask you to do. And that was to give up his own life to save you. If you have not experienced that relationship with a loving God like that, I would implore you to do so today. Because we never know, regardless what the world does, we never know when our last breath will be. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. But when that time comes, we have been told that in Revelation, that we will all stand before the throne room of God and the books will be open and we will be judged according to our works. But here's the catch. There's one other book along with those other books and it's called the Book of Life. And that book of life was written by the Savior himself. And every person who calls on him as Savior and accepts him in their heart, their name's written in that book. And guess what? All those things that you did, because we know that we cannot stand on our own. We cannot get to heaven on good works. We cannot get to heaven on how good we are. It's only if our name is written in the book of life. And Jesus will stand before the Father in your presence and say, this one's mine. I bought this one with my blood. Folks, if you have not asked him in your heart, I would ask you to do so today. And if you have any questions, oh, feel free to come talk to me because I would love to talk to you. And normally at a revival, they have an altar call. And you know what? If you even feel compelled to get out of your car and to come up front, you do just that. Amen.
Hear the words from Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved, through faith and not of your own. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, oh, there are just so many hearts out there in this world, so many hearts that are yearning, that are hungering for your love, the good things that are happening, the people that are still coming to you and being baptized all over the world, even in these times, gives us so much hope and lets us know that you are in control. There is a list on the back of this bulletin and there are so many more that aren't even listed that are on our hearts and minds at this time. And dear Lord, we know that you are the God of all gods and you know personally what each person's struggle is. We ask that you would come into their life and you would heal it. You would make that whole, whether it be physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, financially, because you are just that kind of God. In Hebrew, you're called Abba. Av means father, but Abba means daddy. Dear Lord, we thank you that we have somebody. You can't have a daddy and call them that without having a relationship. We ask that you would have a special blessing on each and every one that's not just here, but that's watching and listening and those that are going to stumble across this message on YouTube, maybe even years to come, that these words are going to sink deep in their hearts and make them want to know you and make them want to give their hearts to you because you gave your life for us. We thank you for everything you've given us. And we thank you for the prayer that we can pray to you anytime, any place, on our knees, standing up, laying prostrate. Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. And since I can't hear you, give me a honk. Hear the encouraging words from Acts from Peter. Chapter 16, verses 30 through 31. Sirs, what must we do to be saved? So they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And from chapter 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Would you join with me at this time, singing Jesus Loves Me? I have the background, but I think we can do it without. So we come as an attitude of gratitude before Christ's feast. Let us remember that ultimately, besides all the power and, the, and being creator and all magnificent and all knowing and all awesome, that he loves you and me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so.
As we come to our time of communion, hopefully you brought the elements. If you're watching from home, you've got them out and ready. If you're sitting in your cars, hopefully you brought them with you. Once we get back into church, communion is going to look a little different. Um, I know they make individual packets, and so we're going to look into that. It's not expensive. Or we may just have you continue to bring yours from home. But it's the act. It's the act of remembrance. Just like the scriptures, just like the stories. We do it over and over and over, so we do not forget. Jesus sat with his friends that last Passover meal, and they were sitting, performing the act that had taken place since Moses led the, Egypt, the Israelites out of Egypt. They were remembering. And he lifted up the bread, and he blessed it, and he gave thanks to God, and he broke it. And he said, this is now going to be my body, which is broken for you. Every time you eat of this, do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, I'm sure it wasn't Welch's grape juice, but he picked up the cup, the fruit of the vine. But that fruit was going to represent a new thing. It was the cup of salvation already from God, Yahweh, but now Jesus lifts it up to his fellow friends, and he said, this is now going to be a new covenant, a new cup of salvation. It's going to be my blood, which will be poured out for the forgiveness of all sin. Every time you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. And so as Christians, we come before Christ's feast, his banquet that has been prepared for us daily, remembering his death, proclaiming his resurrection, and proclaiming his coming again. The body of Christ, broken for you. Amen. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation, shed for you. Would you bow your heads, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and before your table thanking you for the physical act, for the elements that we can continue to do to remember that which you did for us and that which you promise us and that which you're coming back for us. Thank you. In your almighty name we pray. Amen. So now you can join with me in our next hymn. It's Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb? We're going to do the first and the fourth verse.
Okay, by honk, I want to know how many have been washed in that blood of the lamb. And for those of you who weren't honking, I want you to come up front afterwards and see me. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will never die. They will have life and have it abundantly. Romans 10, 9 through, 9 through 10 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the good news, you are saved. Would you join with me? We're actually going to do two verses of There is Power in the Blood. We're going to do the first and the fourth. week in our churches different times <laughs> the time change may you go now and forevermore amen <laughs>